here on your left side, I guess. I don't know, right? Oh my, I'm confused. <laughs> and I'm doing your introduction and then I let you uh, do your presentation, okay? Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> So I'm very happy to introduce Professor Marina Irota to you. Uh, Marina is a role model for me uh, for many reasons, and that's why she's here, and that's why she's presenting to you as well. I think she can be a role model for many people. Um, <laughs> and one of the first reasons why she's a role model for me is because we share the same background. We came from the same university, from the same um, degree, from the same bachelor degree. So Marina, Marina has a bachelor degree from Universidade Estadual de Campinas in applied mathematics. And she followed the steps to biology slash ecology later in her career. She did a master's in computer or electrical engineer. I don't know how to <laughs> explain that, but... And she studied neural networks also at Unicampi. And finally, she did her PhD uh, working with the effects of natural fires and global climate change on vegetation distribution in the South America. Under the graduate program in meteorology uh, or atmosp atmospheric sciences from INPE, and INPE is a national institute here in Brazil that deals with space research. As you can see, she has changed in her life a while. <laughs> Later, she went to the Netherlands to work on tipping points in climate vegetation systems at the, oh my God, Weyhind University in Research. I cannot say this name, but it's W-U-R, if you look in, in your internet, uh, along with Martin Schaeffer. If you don't know him, it's a good chance to research about him as well. Currently, Marina is a professor at Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina, where she is seeking to understand the mechanisms in different scales and within the atmosphere and biosphere to qualify and quantify the scientific basis of tipping points in South America ecosystems. Uh, she's also part of the group of interdisciplinary environmental studies, IPES, I like this name, at her university. So help me to welcome Manina. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? They said yes. Usually you just <laughs> listen to us um, by the microphone, so someone can answer things. <laughs> uh, OK, OK. Super. Um, for me, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Flavia and Ricardo. I, I'm not sure if Ricardo is there, but thank you very much for the invitation to participate um, on the program. I've um, not worked, but talked a lot with the Serra Pileira Institute about this program in the beginning. So I'm very happy that it's happening now. And there are so many people there. Um, unfortunately, I cannot see your faces very clearly and see if I know anyone, but it's a pleasure to be here. And also thanks, Flavia, for the <laughs> very informal and nice introduction you gave of me. Um, um, I'm going to present a little bit of my personal background as well, so I can speak Wachen again, that uh, Flavia couldn't. Uh, the university I, I spent some time in the Netherlands. Okay, so I'm gonna try to share my screen just because I think some of you in the audience and in this program um, may be um, going through the same path I did. So just for you to know uh, that my life is about connecting dots and dots that didn't make any sense in the beginning. Okay, um, so the first thing I want to present is me when I was 18 here and full of doubts. And of course, when I was 18, I didn't know what to do. And my plan A was to play volleyball in the national team. That was my plan A. But um, because I'm half Japanese and it's not totally allowed in my family to do something like that. I decided to go to the university 
And then I searched for courses and to bachelor degrees and other things. But, you know, I was not very excited about any of those. And then I found someone who told me that if I would go for mathematics, which I like it very much, I could do basically whatever I wanted afterwards, because I, I could apply mathematics to mostly anything. And then I did my exams and I got in applied mathematics and I graduated, but before that I tried many things. So I worked with cryptography in bank security, biomechanics, uh, geophysics, biomathematics, among other things. These are the ones I liked the most, but I tried many things under um, doing my undergraduate uh, course. And I was not decided yet. So I, <laughs> I just decided that I wanted to do academia because basically I could still play volleyball. I could also um, travel. I wouldn't need to dress formally. And yeah, I wouldn't have like working hours from eight to five. So these were, <laughs> these were my prerequisites to decide for academia. And then I said, okay, if I go for an academic life, so I'm gonna, uh, search for a master's degree, right? But I didn't want to stay in the same institute I was, so I decided to go to um, the um, to do engineering, so applied mathematics, right? And then I worked with time series forecasting for Streamflow, um, so Streamflow forecasting for the national. Um, how do you call this? Um, energy program in Brazil. So this is a nice national program for planning in terms of um, energy. And stream flows are very important to this planning. So we applied uh, models of including artificial intelligence techniques to predict time series evolution. Okay, so I, I changed a bit, but it was still mathematics. And then I didn't want to continue on that. It was all about feeling. I didn't have a plan. I have to be very clear about that. I didn't have any plan. I just wanted to play volleyball still. And then after that, I decided to yeah, search for places to do things with mathematics. And then I came to a guy, very famous one. Maybe you've heard of him. It, his name is Carlos Nobre. And he's, he's won many prizes and stuff. And then I, he kind of won me over. He presented me something very interesting about vegetation and climate and climate change. And then he said, yeah, you should apply for the PhD program here. So I did. And I did my PhD in meteorology, as Flavio already said, in CP Tech. Um, which belongs to INPE, the National Institute for Space Research in Brazil. And I work with models of atmosphere and vegetation interactions. But then I got very frustrated because the models couldn't really represent vegetation in a way I believed in. And I was very naive in terms of plants, but I still, they were not very representative and comprehensively, I couldn't really see the results and believe in the results I was generating. So I decided to move forward and learn ecology. And that I did. I went to the Netherlands at Wageningen University and Research Center, and I worked um, with theoreticians uh, in ecology, modelers, basically but they had this idea of linking theory to data. And I like it there very much. And I spent two years in the Netherlands and I learned a lot about ecology and about how to integrate or link the theory I'm going to present to you here. And maybe you already saw in the program to data available, okay? And then when I came back to Brazil, I came to Florianópolis, southern Brazil, very far away from the tropics, very seasonal. It's very cold here now. And I got in 
the, to teach uh, for the meteorology bachelor degree, but it's located in the department of physics. So I teach physics as well nowadays. Not that I know very much, but I do teach physics. Okay, and I think it's very important to say also that I had a baby in 2017 and he's now five years old and he's, to me, he's a, a motivation, but more than that, an inspiration to do science because I think all the kids were born scientists. So I, I think I'm more creative and effective after he was born. So just for you to know that it's possible to have a scientific life after you have kids, if you want. Okay. And then after my personal presentation, I'm going to say that this talk is going to, co to be composed by all these elements and all these dots. Um, but I'm still a bit in doubt and I have many questions. So in the end, after this circle, I'm still here, like I was 18, but now instead of playing volleyball, I'm surfing and um, taking care of a baby and still with questions. So I think this is for me what science means today, having questions, having fun, and being able to integrate different knowledge fields to, to, to have answers to that step by step. Okay, so this presentation will be about connecting dots as was my academic life. Okay, and then what I'm gonna, I'm gonna guide you through today is um, to, to get to tipping points and resilience for the Amazonian ecosystems um, is to use a, a short introduction from larger to finer spatial scales and what I'm gonna talk about and what motivates me to study the Amazonia today, and also the other tropical biomes, savannas and shrublands like the Caatinga in Brazil, but mostly today, Amazonia. The theoretical framework I used, and I think it connects to, what, to some of the things you're gonna see in the program, and how we started connecting theory to data and yeah, like unraveling tipping points in resilience for tropical ecosystems. And then the disturbances we currently have in the Amazon and the impact these disturbances are causing currently. And then the potential trajectories we are gonna, we, we, we can have while crossing tipping points or not. So these lessons come from ecology mostly and not necessarily from the theoretical ecology, but fieldwork ecology. And then the challenges and next steps we have ahead for this specific topic and how, if you are interested, you could help uh, investigating those things. Okay, so this is basically what I'm going to show you today, connecting all these dots. So first of all, um, as you may know, the Earth is constantly changing. So we have the past Earth, like thousands and millions and billions of years ago. And then we have the present Earth that we are currently living. And then we don't know what's gonna go next, right? So we are starting from a planetary scale, very large scale. And then we are going to narrow this down to the Amazon. But I think this is, is an important path to make. So planetary, the Amazon and why the Amazon? Okay, so we know that it's constantly changing. And what's gonna happen in the future? What type of earth we are going to live in? Does it matter? How long will it take? Is it only natural oscillations we are facing or is it anthropogenic climate change? All these questions can be here in this slide, right? So the earth, I don't know if you know that, but just to, to be on the same page for everyone, uh, the Earth system, it's a system and it's composed by five spheres. 
So we have the hydrosphere, water in different phases, solid, liquid, and vapor. We have the atmosphere, uh, which compo is composed by the gases we have in the atmosphere. Cryosphere, the ice cover we have around the globe, the biosphere, on land, and eventually in the sea as well, right? In the oceans and in lakes. And the geosphere, the very deep part we have coming up or coming out to the surface. So we have five spheres, all these spheres interact. So they are all subsystems of the earth system and earth system and they interact and they have feedbacks, they have processes involved. And so we have a very complex system as an, an earth system, okay? So again, just to be on the same page, we are gonna take the earth system as a dynamic system which means it evolves in time, it's adaptive, it evolves while adapting to different conditions. And so it involves feedback mechanisms and equilibrium states. And in here, I, I don't know if you can see that clearly, but this is um, a system, our body, and how the temperature of our body is in equilibrium. The temperature of equilibrium is more or less 36.5 Celsius, and then if the temperature increases, so it, it oscillates, right, around an equilibrium. So if the temperature increases, you sweat, and then um, your sweat evaporates, so you cool down, and then the temperature drops. But if it drops too much, you have goosebumps, and you have less convection, and then you have temperature increases. So the Earth system works the same way with equilibriums and oscillations around this equilibrium, right? So if you have a disturbance of a perturbation in one of these circles here, you're gonna have a feedback mechanism, a feedback mechanism along all the chain of interactions. And then the disturbance can evolve in a way that it takes this equilibrium or uh, the system out of the equilibrium and to another state. Um, it could be um, like a stable state or an unstable state, but you can change the state of your system depending on how you disturb it, right? And more than dynamic and adaptive, you have an, a complex system, meaning that you have emergent patterns, like this type of patterns you have for a bunch of fish together, or within a dry land, you have the distribution of different uh, vegetation cover in special patterns that are self-organized like in coral reefs. So you have emergent patterns, right? So the third for us today, or in general, is going to be dynamical, adaptive, and complex. And this involves feedback mechanisms, equilibrium, and self-organization. Super. And then in the Earth system, within all the five spheres I presented to you, we have like what we call tipping elements of the Earth system. So Greenland ice sheet, Arctic summer ice sheet. So the thing is that the tipping elements are very, very important because they are key subsystems that can flip to another state and change through this chain of interactions represented by the arrows, the arrows, sorry, they can change other tipping elements and the global climate in general. So all these elements can regulate climate, the global climate, and they can uh, self-regulate each other. So all of them are connected. It's like our body and different organs, and they are all connected in a chain of interactions, okay? So what is the equilibrium temperature of the planet? It was 15 degrees Celsius. But now um, we know that we, we are increasing this temperature. So we have here um, increases in one to three, um, I, I would ask you, but you cannot say instead, or except you have the microphone, right? So I'm gonna 
just keep going. Um, we have increased our temperature in the planet now by 1. almost 5 degrees Celsius or degrees in general. And then the tipping elements are at risk. That's why they're tipping because they can flip depending on the equilibrium temperature of the earth. So you have from one to three degrees Celsius. So we are in 1.5 more or less now approximately. So if we change one to three, we can shift all the tipping elements in yellow, in orange, three to five, and that includes the Amazon rainforest, the thermal highline circulation, that are very important to thermoregulate all the Northern Atlantic Ocean and places like Scandinavia and Antarctica. They are all dependent on this circulation here in the Atlantic. And more than five degrees, we have Eastern Antarctic ice sheet, which is very consistent and stable, and it can melt down eventually, okay? And the permafrost in Siberia, that stores lots of carbon below the ice cover. So all of these subsystems here can tip depending on the equilibrium temperature of the earth and changes in this equilibrium temperature. So in this sense, we have the Amazon as one of the tipping elements of the earth system and able to connect to other tipping elements and thermoregulate the planet and the entire circulation and the climate patterns all over the globe. So this is per se already a, a good motivation to study the Amazon because for me, I'm in tropical South America, I'm almost a tropical being and I'm interested in developing science for and in Brazil. So in this sense, the Amazon becomes a very important feature in this context. And in the Amazon, we see because of climate change, it might be that we have um, increasing drought and extreme drought events, like the ones we had in 2005 and 2010. These are um, places close to Manaus from local newspapers. And what we had here in, in some parts of the Amazon um, was an increase water deficit. So in here, this MCWD is um, an index to show water deficit, especially in the dry season. So in here we have the redder, the more water deficit we had. So you see here that in 2005, we have in southwestern Amazon, um, a very strong water deficit in, in 2010, all over the southern boundaries of the Amazon basin plus eastern Amazon, a very strong effect of drought. And the question is how will vegetation or the ecosystems within the Amazon respond to this, types of, uh, this type of perturbation? So we have a subsystem now, we have the earth, we have the Amazon here, and then this will connect to other elements and how the Amazon will respond to disturbances and to perturbations like droughts and other things we are going to see ahead. Okay, how? How do we model that? So we have evidence from modeling um, that in the future, the forest here in green could, depending on the pathway proposed by the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, it could change to a bit of a savanna here in northern and eastern parts, or also most of the forest could disappear and turn into a savanna. Okay, this is quite old, but this is just a motivation. I don't really believe anymore that it's gonna turn into a savanna, but just for you to, to, to know that this, mod at least for me, motivated studying how this type of change could happen. And would it happen indeed, right? Because this is all models. And then also other places on earth, like in Africa, 
were in the past, like in the middle Holocene, when the temperature was at peak in terms of um, warmer temperatures. So we had a green equilibrium here in the Sahara Desert, like in very western parts, because of the inversion of the monsoon system, monsoon system. And this monsoon system made the, this part here um, more rainy and with more, mo with more moisture. And so we had a bit of green. So we have a green Sahara and a desert Sahara, two different equilibrium states backwards in the past. So do we have catastrophic shifts and tipping points associated with this type of change? Can we represent this by uh, tipping points? I would like to know your thoughts about that, but we can leave it for later. So the theoretical framework we can apply here is this. So um, if some of you are biologists or ecologists, um, you know that in general, we, you have this type here, the first type of graph. So the, in here, we would have the response variable, but I'm going to call it ecosystem state. And the conditions here, like soil nutrients versus uh, the amount of trees we have here, right? So how the response variable responds to here, to the conditions. And then, in general, we fit this with a linear curve, at least in ecology um, pieces I've read. So people try to do linear, and if it doesn't work or if it's too bad, they try non-linear like this one. But this one, the second one, is very specific, right? And it has like a, a more intense drop here, which is called the half saturation point right, more or less. And then this, after here, you have a very quick drop downwards. It's a little bit different than this, that this has a very, a very nice, a constant rate of change. And this has different rates, the rates of changes, right? Okay, so last, we can have this type of behavior. So it's like, we squeeze this curve and stretch it, stretch it like sideways. And then we are gonna have this S type behavior here, which has two magical points, F1 and F2, which are called bifurcation points. And these are the ones that the bifurcation points translate into tipping points, right? So these are the tipping points because your system can come very slow in change here in ecosystem states and more in conditions till, till it reaches the tipping point and if, if crosses it, it can drop very abruptly downwards. Or we can come to a very unstable state here and go upwards or downwards. So we, the system can be um, in a mess, so high entropy, very um, messy behavior and then going towards because of feedback mechanisms towards a different state up or down it's more desired or less desired state doesn't matter it can go um, both ways okay so these are the type or this is the type of behavior we have um, when we have tipping points and abrupt shifts or very catastrophic shifts, okay? So for the same conditions here from F1 and F2, I can have either this state or this for the same condition. So let's say 100 millimeters a year of rain, I can either have this state here or this state here, right? And this is the bi-stability we call. Okay, so contextualizing in our earth system, if we have the ecosystem state, it could be the Amazon, it could be um, the Greenland ice sheet, it could be anything in an ecosystem, you can have change in conditions. For example, if we have climate change and the effects of climate change in the Amazon, um, can be extreme droughts, more intense, more frequent, and um, like a dry season length, uh, which is 
longer. Okay, so if you change the conditions here, you can have a sudden drop because you cross the tipping point, forward shift and backward shift, characterizing what we call the hysteresis, hysteresis, sorry. Or we can also have human activities changing the state of the ecosystem. So you come here, you deforest part of the forest, so you drop and you cross the unstable region here. And from this stable region, you can go down. Okay, so this is, these are basically the two ways you can change um, the system or disturb the system, either in the conditions or in the uh, ecosystem state. So this is the theoretical framework and it connects to another concept here, which is also theoretical and had been proposed in the literature in the early 2000s. So from this figure here with hysteresis, bi-stability, we can have either stable states, which are the solid lines, and unstable states along the dashed lines here. And from this here, you see the conditions, the ecosystem state, right? The bifurcation points. And in this slices here of the conditions, you can transform into stability landscapes like this ones to measure the resilience of the system. So this is like the, the jump you make from um, this type of graph here to this type of graph um, showing resilience based on the basing of attractions of the system. So all is done with mathematics and statistics, okay? Uh, lots of it, oh, lots of them. Okay, so this second slice, you have two stable states, so by stability here and the depth and width of these basings of attractions can be calculated and quantified. And this, the bi-stability persists, persists, and then you have only the lower ecosystem state here, okay? So this is the connection we have between um, alternative states, tipping points, and resilience in theory. Okay, but can we rely only on theory and models? So many models have shown alternative stable states like conceptual models, complex models, and theory, but how could we check this with data? Are there, is there data or are there available data sets we can check? And this, I'm going to go to the Amazon more, right? So different ecosystems can have different data, but more into the Amazon now. So remote sensing for this regional or continental scale offers a great opportunity. So data from satellites. And then what we did as a first step um, was to get a condition, mean annual precipitation, so the accumulated precipitation over a year and the mean of it uh, between 61 and 2002. And we have as ecosystem states, three cover percentage from a satellite. So the greener, the more, the, the higher the percentage in tree cover here, okay? So the Amazon is um, very much highlighted in darker green. But then we did for all the continents, um, the tropical belt, extended tropical belt for Africa, for Australia, taking out the outback of Australia just because uh, it's a lot of desert and a lot of treeless uh, points. And then this, the, the, this part of South America. And then what we did first, we did, we asked, are there alternative stable states? And one way of doing this, deceiving time, because we don't have time here, we only have space. So we have a snapshot of the system, right? Here we have the mean, which, which in climatology is very important, right? So just one year is, is not trust, so we get the mean, so one snapshot of more or less here, 40 years, and then we have 200, 201 tree cover, so snapshots. 
And we are going to deceive time in an approach called space for time substitution. We substitute time by space. So here we have more rainfall associated with more tree cover. And then here it's like the time has passed and then now we have instead of more rainfall, we have less rainfall and what's, what, what happens in here in the system. So we are deceiving time because we don't have a long enough time series to evaluate here, okay? And then we do two things basically. One is a histogram, very simple, of the tree cover, regardless of the conditions. And what we have is like the distribution of tree cover all over these places, the, those places I showed, Africa, Australia, and, and South America. And then we have here, look, this is quite interesting, right? It's just a histogram. So the distribution is um, higher around zero, meaning no tree cover, treeless. So it goes down and then we have another mode, which we called something else, which picks in 20% tree cover and 80% tree cover. So we call this different states. It's an indirect way of doing this, but then we have the treeless state, the savanna state, and the forest state, higher or equal than 60%. So this is just the first graph we made, okay? And then we say, okay, so if we include conditions, what happens, right? So up to 300 millimeters a year of rainfall, we only have treeless. If we increase rainfall, see, what happens to the system? It goes a little bit more here, but still predominantly, predominantly you have treeless. And then by stability or by modality occurs here to up to 900 millimeters. Okay, so for, from 600 to 900. And then we start having savannas. And then um, from 900 to 1200, we have treeless less, more savannas and so on. Until you don't have treeless, but you have savannas and forests, savannas and forests, and only mostly forests, forests. And above 2,500 millimeters, you only have forests. And then if we have a scatter plot, oops, sorry. If we have this scatter plot, the ecosystem state um, here represented by a tree cover and the mean annual precipitation representing the conditions. So resembling the figure I showed you, what do we see? Can you see this type of behavior here in this figure with data? Can you see that? Um, I didn't, I couldn't, I couldn't see anything, but the guys with whom I worked, they could, and they did. Um, so they could see a state here, a forest state, instability here, so not lots of points here, see? And then the savanna here, where you have more density of points here, it's higher, it's more dense here. And then the treeless state here with an instability here again. Okay, if you see that, you say, okay, but this is just your eyes, right? You, you see what you want to see. So you, we have to apply a bit of statistics. And then there's this procedure that basically is um, clustering procedure with a different tune towards evaluating and identify, identifying alternative stable states. Then what you can see here is the same data with the stability landscapes underneath. So you have unstable here, right, in white, and forest and darker, see the valleys here and here of savannas and treeless and instability here and here. So we can show that there is this type of behavior when we deceive time, right? So from theoretical stability landscapes, we can have stability landscapes based on data. So we did this and then we can start inferring um, resilience of systems based on these stability landscapes and other measures. Super. But resilience can be quite broad 
I don't know how much you were in contact with this type of concept, so I'm going, I'm going to present this. There are basically two types of resilience. One, the engineering resilience, which is the capacity to recover to the same state after disturbances, meaning that you always have one stable state and then you oscillate more or less depending on the disturbance, but you assume you always go back to the same state. If you don't, you don't measure resilience. And the ecological resilience, which is the capacity to persist over time. It seems the same, but it's not when you quantify it. And this implies the existence of alternative states because um, if you don't persist, you flip to another one, but you can measure um, these basings of attraction in a way. It's the same, it can be the same measure, but the assumption behind it is different, okay? Anyways, one way of measuring the resilience is by, if you have a massive amount of data, is to calculate the probability of being in a certain state, in this case, for the Amazon, the far state. And this is the probabilities, zero to 25%, blah, 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 25 to 100% chance to be there. And then you see that the darker, the more chances you will have to be a forest, right? So you were more resilient. This is an indirect, is a proxy measure to resilience. It's just the probability of being in a state. So you have here in darker green, the most resilient part of the Amazon and in lighter green, Eastern Amazon, Southeastern Amazon, naturally less resilient just because these places here are more exposed to oscillations in rainfall, okay? And then this is one way of measuring resilience, but there are other ways we're gonna see one, another one um, ahead. But just for you to keep in mind, the probability of being a state can be a measure of resilience. In this context of ecological resilience, the stability landscapes that I'm showing you. And the mechanisms could be deterministic, very direct, because we are dealing with um, mean rainfall, not the climate, because the climate is not totally, totally deterministic. But then you have this type of measure here in terms of the climate, deterministic, and is stochastically, if you think about fires and the relation of fires with less rainfall. So less rainfall, more flammability, more fires eventually. So that's why we in general have more fires in years that you have uh, a more intense dry season or an extreme drought occurring in the Amazon. And this is very well reported all over the media and broadcasted all over the world, right? The fires in the Amazon. So in here, considering fires, which is another approach, you have bi-stability. It's very, very much the same, slightly different, but then in here you have the probability, in here you have only bi-stability, right? It's not necessarily a measure, but a, a category of deterministic low tree cover, deterministic forest, which is in agreement with what we have, but then bi-stability all over the place, right? Currently low tree cover in orange and light green currently forest. And these are the bi-stables. Under the same conditions, because of fire, you could flip from one state to the other. So the mechanisms behind it, okay? And then if you, we think about tipping points and what we extract from this cutter plot I showed here, uh, here, how can we infer tipping point values, right? So in here you have the low tree cover, high tree cover, forests and savanna states, we called. And then what we have here, we have um, a range from 1300 to 2000 millimeters a year. And um, savannas like deterministically, they occur in a range um, from three, 1300 to 
a bit below 2000. And then there is this, this, um, what do we call this crossing over part here, that tropical forest overlaps with savanna. So higher than 200, 2000 millimeters, you have forests. But between here, this part, you have both possibilities, right? And this can be related to the fire regime and to the dynamics, the special dynamics in regions that you have this boundary between forests and savannas. So it has been proposed or um, two, two fire thresholds. So two, not tipping points, but thresholds. One is related to the individual level, so one tree, and is related to a trait called bark thickness. How thick is the bark of a tree? So the relative bark thickness for savannas are higher than for trees. So if you have a certain, if you cross a certain threshold in bark thickness, your fire resistance, you don't burn, you thrive. And then another one is the fire suppression th threshold at the community level. So more trees, right? Different species of trees. If they clump together and they close the canopy, you don't have a flammable environment. So canopy closure allows for forests thrive, for forests to thrive, right? Because you inhibit fires because fires need fl flammable fuel, right? So those tipping points are very broad, very general, but they are tipping points um, investigated and unveiled through the space for time substitution approach and related to fire regimes. Okay, but what other tipping points we have identified using same, not same, but similar approaches from different sources, modeling, other types of data, and a mixture of data and modeling. We have the one I already showed and spoiled you with. There was three to five, and in here it's two to five, so there is no total consensus here. But the global warming of two, or including a threshold in two to five, so this range would be, the tipping point would be within this range. And it has been revealed from large scale modeling, complex models coupled with atmosphere, vegetation, ocean. So, and, and the mechanism behind this global climate change, changing the regional climate in the Amazon with less severe reduction or more severe reduction, leading to a total forest dieback, which increases emissions in CO2 eventually because of fires and deforestation and feedback in the global climate change again. So you have less moisture from the Amazon, you change the circulation in the entire planet. So you have changes, regional changes in other places and in the global climate, right? And if you have less severe reduction, it will depend on how vegetation respond to these changes. You can change the forest and have no dieback, or you can have a forest dieback anyway, depending on how the forest responds. And this is a super question mark here. We don't know how forests will respond to increasing CO2 and rainfall reduction. We are trying to um, investigate this further, but still is a big question mark. Okay, so we don't know what's going to happen here, but this is the feedback mechanism that reinforces global climate change into changes in the regional climate of the Amazon. So if you have only the dry season length, which is one of the features that is affected by climate change, the global climate change, the dry season length and intensity. Um, we have that a length with more than seven months of dry season, you don't have any chance to have forests and you have an intensity, and this is in this rectangle here, an intensity of and this is the water deficit I showed you in my first, one of my first slides. 
So it's the accumulated dry season deficit. And it's always negative because it's a deficit, right? So it's 300 millimeters a year of deficit. If you have less than this or more negative values, the chances to be a rainforest is very low. So you, you were more likely to be in a savanna state. So the three minus 300 millimeters, 300 to 400 millimeters is the range for dry season intensity, okay? And there is another tipping point, and this is not related to conditions, but this is related to deforestation. So changes in the state of the ecosystem and is related to evapotranspiration feedback. And this has been proposed, including modeling trends in deforestation and trends in changes in rainfall changes um, historically. And then what we have is imagine that we, we have a recycling um, behavior here of rainfall. So you have rainfall and then the forest um, grows and evapotranspires more, and then you have more chances to have rainfall again. And this is this great recycling of rainfall that occurs in forest. If you cut off the trees, you decrease evapotranspiration, and then you have less moisture to condense, turn into clouds and fall again. So you have less chance to have a forest, right? So based on this feedback mechanism, it has been hypothesized that 20-25% deforestation of the entire Amazon. If you cross this number, you can, like because of the feedback mechanism, you can turn the, the entire basin into a savanna. Okay? So we are, and then you can ask, okay, um, how are we? And how far are we now? We are close to 18 now very close to 18% deforestation in the Amazon, okay? So very close to the, the lower range tipping point, lower end of the tipping point range here. And then um, I spoiled a bit, but how are things already changing? Are we close to, the, to reaching a tipping point or crossing a tipping point? Have we crossed already? Um, this is a question you can help us find out because we're not sure. There are lots of uncertainties, but I'm going to show you the disturbances at play and how things are changing in the Amazon. Okay. So, um, climate uh, has been changing in the Amazon in different ways. So, um, in here, in terms of, and here you have temperature, rainfall, extreme rainfall, extreme rainfall events, extreme drought events, and flooding. So you have different types of events. And we can see that in historically, the temperatures in these regions of the Amazon, um, so a bit of Western, Central, Eastern, Northeastern, and North, you have increases in temperature with high confidence in blue, median confidence in red. So changes in precipitation were not really significant, but we have increases in extreme rainfall, extreme droughts, and flooding, all of them at once, but happening more frequently and more intensely. On the other hand, Indian West or Northwestern Amazon, remember, these are the part more resilient that I showed you in darker green. We have increases, temper increases in temperature, we have um, more extreme, um, sorry, more rainfall. So see in here, we, we, are, we have more rainfall and not less. And then we have flooding occurring more as well. So more water somehow and more temperature, meaning that the water with more temperature, higher temperatures um, can turn or can uh, change phases more rapidly, right? So you enhance the hydrological cycle in this region. And all of them, because temperature increases are everywhere. But then look, precipitation here is decreasing in southern, in the southern boundaries of the Amazon. And the, the droughts here are increasing. 
So you see that somehow, if you sum up all the effects, you kind of have a mess, but a mess that is trying to really reach some sort of balance in terms of water that falls and evaporates from it, falls from the sky and evaporates from Earth. Okay, so this is already changing. And the dry season we spoke is also changing in Southern Amazon. So we see here, this is the years and the annual cycle from January to December. So we see that after the mid seventies that we have a shift in the climate, the global climate in general, you see a pattern of extending the dry season or, the, or decreasing or um, postponing the onset of the wet season here. Okay, so the beginning of the wet season is delayed, meaning that after the plants are already stressed, after the dry season, they are a little bit more stressed. So currently, we are increasing, not we, but we are seeing an increase in dry season length. And the delay is about 15 days already, not even a month, but 15 days more stress for plants, okay? If you add to this deforestation, increasing fires, you have the disturbances. So global climate change, interregional climate change, dry season length, um, events or extreme events in rainfall, deforestation and fires are the disturbances of our subsystem in the Amazonian. And how the increasing in dry season intensity is impacting vegetation functioning and structure. So if you have the dry season intensification here, you see again the MCWD, our measure of um, seasonality intensity. So, um, and the trends in it, and because it's a negative value, the rather the more intense the dry season is becoming and the bluer the less intense the dry season is becoming. So you see all the Amazon have decreasing precipitation, increasing precipitation and so forth so, so on. Different patterns, very heterogeneous and what is it causing here? It's causing, see, this is interesting, mortality of wet affiliated species, meaning that they deal okay with lots of water, no seasonality. And at the same time, as they are dying, the recruitment of new species is associated with dry affiliated species, meaning that they cope better with drier environments and more seasonal environments, more variable environments. So we are already seeing a shift in structure of the forest and functionality of the forest, but it's still a forest, not a savanna. Still canopy closure, still not like a sparse tree with herbaceous layer, okay? But we are seeing it, right? However, we don't have measurements in southern Amazon, southeastern Amazon, which happens to be the place where you have the most deforested parts of the Amazon, Southern and Southeastern Amazon. And then exactly in this place, we just had a report on the Amazon becoming a carbon source. So it's not more a sink of carbon. It's not it's storing more carbon than emitting, but it's emitting more than storing exactly in this place here. So when this paper came out, the reporters and journalists came to me and asked, have we reached the tipping point here? And my, my answer was, I don't know, because it seems it has changed, but is it permanent? Is it persistent in time? We don't know. So we have to keep monitoring and trying to come up with methodologies to evaluate that without a proper time series, a long time series, right? So it's interesting here because you see deforestation, rainfall um, in the dry season and temperature in the dry season and excluding fire events. Because when you put fire events on the equation, naturally you have lots of emission, right? Because you're burning uh, organic matter. So you have CO2 and CO coming up and up and up to the atmosphere. So in here we have 
the total in blue, the total carbon flux. In red, the total carbon flux when you have fires, related to fire events. And in, in green, you have the difference among these two. So if you have a negative value, right? So this one, blue minus red, if it's negative, all the source of carbon is related to fires, most of it. So the place is, is still a sink in this case. And here in Western Amazon, Southwestern Amazon, all negative, right? All below. But here in Southeastern Amazon, we have a plus, meaning that regardless of fire events, this region is already emitting more than absorbing carbon. And then all of this together with changes in, in deforestation, increases in deforestation, decreases in precipitation in the dry season here, August, September, October, and um, increases in fire in general. Okay, so this part has already changed, but is it permanent? We don't know yet. So the Amazonia and the global, global climate work in, in this feedback, way here. You have deforestation, fires, land use, and this goes to the global climate, and the global climate um, responds, right, to climate change, enhancement of climate change, increasing dresses in length, and the extremes. And this also reinforces deforestation, fires, and land use change. So it's a chain of interactions again, and the Amazon is extremely important in regulating the global climate. Okay, and if we think about resilience, um, again, in this special distribution, you, one person can think, okay, but we have like moisture flow here, right? Due to the uh, trade winds coming from the Atlantic, Northwestern and East, Southeastern trade winds, and they come, they bring Atlantic Ocean moisture, they come and they pass over a large amount of forest here. They are channeled in the Andes and they go to Foz do Iguaçu in the waterfalls we have there and in a region that rains a lot and it accounts for moisture from the Atlantic and from the Amazon in this low level jet we have here. So if, we have, again, the deforestation increases, transpiration decreases, the same uh, feedback mechanism I showed you. We can also have cascading downstream effects because if deforestation happens here, so you see that in here, because of the cascading moisture recycling, we don't see decreases in resilience. So in here is how resilience is changing. The yellowish or the yellower, the more you have uh, in decreases in resilience. So in here, this region here that can be quite rich in water available and also nutrients, it happens to be nutrients as well. It can be, it can um, have your, uh, it can have a loss of resilience because deforestation takes place here in Eastern Amazon because of this downstream impacts. And the same evapotranspiration feedback I showed you. And then the second measure of resilience I wanted to show you is based on temporal autocorrelation leg one. So it measures how much the system was similar in the time step T plus one in relation to T. So the closer or the more similar the system is after, after a disturbance, after a disturbance, then you can think, oh, it's more stable. No, it's no more stable. It can be related to um, a concept called slowing down. So it's slowing down in recovering from a disturbance. So after a disturbance, if a system is very slow in recovering this can be a sign of resilience loss. So based on these measures, um, these guys here, they uh, use remote sensing data to assess loss of resilience in the Amazon. And the red dots here are related to 
a loss of resilience. So 75% of the basin is losing resilience. And this resilience loss is very much connected to the distance to land, human land use. So land use change, deforestation is basically what they show is that it's very likely that we have here, see, loss of resilience um, focus on the black, it's decreasing and it, when it crosses here 200, 200 kilometers, you don't have loss of resilience anymore. So the higher loss of resilience here is related to closer places uh, where uh, humans have uh, deforested or changed vegetation cover. Anyways, it's very heterogeneous, right? All over the basin. And the potential trajectories we have, where are we having, heading to, not to savannas only. So if we consider wildfires, yes, we have seen savanna formations within the Amazon because of wildfires, but also, and this is a summary of um, the ecological literature in a very fine scale. So wildfires were found along the Rio Negro um, white sand uh, regions. Okay, so the soils are very important to have a persistent savanna state here. And the fire feedback really takes take, take place in this place. And if you have deforestation plus, plus fire, you have a more open canopy, so no forest anymore, and degraded, it's not a savanna at all, because savannas are very, very, very biodiverse, but the degraded is more like um, very homogeneous, one, two species at most. Or you can be trapped in a closed canopy, degraded secondary forest, sewer forest, closed canopy, but very much less biodiverse than the original and native forest. And in here you have deforestation, fires and land use change. So you keep, you trap the system because you keep changing land or land cover. Okay, so not only a savanna, but different parts, depending on the disturbance, you have a different result. So next step and challenges, I want to bring back everything we saw in the, 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 la the list, latest part of the presentation, just for you to see how heterogeneous is the Amazonian ecosystem. So you have different ecosystems, they respond differently, and the disturbances taking place are different. They are combined or they are um, alone or only one, and still they cause changes and they cause changes to people who live there. And people who live there eventually depend on the forest to to survive and thrive. So indigenous people, traditional communities. So it's very important that even though we don't have a dieback of the Amazon forest, if we have one pixel that changes, this is going to impact people living in the Amazon. This is very important. In any case, how do we deal with the remarkable heterogeneity we see in different parts of the system in terms of improving modeling predictions. And this is very important for people in this program because you can have the ecological and biological um, knowledge and also learn how to translate that into equations or the other way around, right? To predict changes is very hard in a very complex system like this one, full of interactions. How do we deal with heterogeneity, connectivity among cells here. It's very hard. How do we predict tipping points? And that's why I don't have the answer. And secondly, how do we deal with the uncertainty and predictions we already have, right? High complexity, interactions among different spatial and temporal scales. How do we deal with that? And that, I really like this figure here. Um, and then how do we deal with this trajectory we're facing here from the Holocene? Remember the greener Sahara Holocene and now the Anthropocene and we are coming here in time 
And for us to gain Earth system stewardship, we have to take action and eventually uh, prevent the planetary threshold crossing um, very much related to the biosphere, which is the most degraded sphere of the Earth at the moment, the biosphere, and the dynamical, uh, the, sorry, the internal dynamic uh, related to feedbacks that can turn the entire planet into a hothouse Earth that we have already experienced in the past, but the humans were not here yet. So um, I think this program and the people in this program if interested, can help a lot in the next step, the next steps and challenges. So I want to thank you very much and apologize for all the technical problems and say that we don't do things alone. So these are most of the people working with me right now. And yeah, if you have any questions or if we have time for questions, I'm very sorry. <laughs> we, yeah, I don't know. That's it. Thank you. I hope you can listen to people clapping, clapping for you. Okay, I can't. <laughs> they were I'm clapping. Um, yeah, maybe I'm we have... stop for now. Sorry? I'm going to stop the video for now and then okay. if there are questions related to this yeah, slide, I, I was about. going to check if yeah there are questions let me see where is the other microphone where is the other microphone okay uh, we can leave this one here uh hi i'm gabriel i work with uh, uh vegetation models and mm -hmm. i just want to ask real quickly because of the time but what are the models that you are working with now that i still can give new predictions and new insights on the team Okay, thank you, Gabriel. I can see that you're Brazilian, right? From your accent. Okay. Um, specifically, I'm working with a model from the US. It's from a laboratory from NASA called Geophysical Fluid Laboratory, a Geophysical Fluid Dynamic Laboratory, GFDL. And it is one of the models that runs for the IPCC report and it has vegetation dynamics. It's fully coupled with all the spheres except for geosphere, but it represents the Amazon with only one type of forest. So I'm investing now on, with, together with those guys from GFDL to improve representation of tropical and other ecosystems or tropical ecosystems, savannas and different types of savannas uh, within the model, just to see how this changes the responses of ecosystems to uh, different disturbances. So this is the one I'm working now. I think it's quite promising because it's fully coupled. We can evaluate all types of feedbacks in the future, still developing the model, but I'm in my pathway back to modeling. So I learned ecology and then I'm trying to include the ecology I learned together with the ecologists because they know more, much more than me. And then um, trying to include parsimoniously, right? Because we cannot include everything, but um, all we, we can to improve representation of biodiversity in the tropics. If you are interested, in working with this, you are very welcome. <laughs> okay, thank Just you. For you to know, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation. I like a lot. My name is Andrielli. I work with uh, plant response to environment changes, and I, I like a lot your presentation. And I want to know if you know about the increase of the dynamic of fire in this environment if this is increasing the because of the climatic changes okay and the LA, right is that correct okay so the, your question was if fires are increasing because of climate change that, did i get it correctly okay yes so um if we think about fire to have fire, we need four elements, four. 
oxygen that we have a lot in the atmosphere, so this doesn't count. But we need fuel, so we, we need biomass. We need flammability, so it has to be dry enough, otherwise it doesn't catch fire. And we need triggering. And triggering can be naturally in the Cerrado in Brazil, the savannas in the Brazil have natural fires because of lightning. So, right, so you have lightning because the end of the dry season is very dry. And then you start the wet season, you have lots of clouds, it's convective clouds, and they have lightning inside. So this lightning triggers fire because the fuel is high, you have herbaceous cover, and it's dry enough. So you catch fire, it's a very spread forward fire, it's, does, it's not concentrated, and it shapes parts of the savannas in Brazil. But in the forest, you don't have flammability. You do have fuel, naturally, okay? You do have lightning because it rains a lot in the Amazon. And besides raining, you have convective clouds, lots of lightning, thunderstorms, blah, blah, but you don't have flammability. So even if the light, the lightning triggers the fire, it doesn't move forward. So naturally you wouldn't have fire because you don't have the conditions you have fire. Hence, it's very likely that fires are occurring not because of climate change, but climate change in combination with human activities. See, because then if you deforest, if, you, if someone has already been in the forest after, immediately after he has been deforest, deforested, this person can say that it's very, very warm and it feels really weird because it's smoke everywhere, but you feel warm and very much um, warm because of the moisture you have. But after a while, it, it dries out. And then if it dries out and you have different uh, tree logs all over the places, even though you don't have herbaceous plants, you have only the trunks and stuff, but they are dry, it's very easy to catch a fire. If you trigger a fire with fire, right? Human-induced fires. So it's a combination. It's not only climate change. Climate change alone wouldn't do this immediately. If you decrease, if you have mortality mass in the forest, right? And then you can have more herbaceous and this can invade the forest. But mostly, and in our lifetime, in the lifetime of a human being, it's mostly related to human induced fire, just because otherwise you wouldn't have the ingredients to have a fire that kills trees, right? Did I respond? Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Do you want to ask about career or something? Yeah, <laughs> yeah because <laughs> I presented myself in detail, right? My frustrations and everything. Yeah. So if there is no other questions, thank you very much, Marina. And thank you for your availability. Yeah, we my know you are pleasure. so busy and coordinating a program uh, in Universidade Federal de Santa Catarina. So she has a lot of to do right now and she's expanding <laughs> here one hour with, the, with us. It was amazing. Thank you very much for this. Uh, thank you very much, Flavia, for the... Yeah, thanks. I, I'm sure they are inspired by your steps in your career uh, it's fine and if you need anything you can email me okay uh, I, I may take a while to respond but Flavia knows that I'm I really like interacting with people and people from different areas you know so just reach out it's going to be a pleasure to talk and to to know more about what you do okay okay
It's Thank been you. a pleasure. Thank you very much, guys. Thank Enjoy you. the program. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. Ciao.